Welcome to the Money Collective Podcast. We're here to uplift your financial well-being. Your hosts are me, Mel Pierce, and Darlene Yu. We are the co-founders of the Money Collective, and together we have over 50 years of finance and banking experience. We provide the tools, information, and guidance to better understand your money and feel confident making money decisions. Hi, it's uh, Darlene and Mel back for episode four of our podcast. Awesome. Hi, Darlene. (laughs) I'm so excited to be back. I feel like we're getting in a groove now, aren't we? Yeah. And it's part of our life. It's our new baby. I know. We had so much fun, um, you know, in our recording so far. So, uh, yeah, we hope you're going to have as much fun and enjoy the ride. Yeah, that's (laughs) cool. So every um, episode, we start off with our own truth. Yeah. Um, so we always talk about our financial well-being, what that means to us, and that's our everyday life. So you just get a bit of our everyday life. And who we are and what we do and, yep. you know, warts and all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to – or do you want to go first? No, you go. I go. Yes. Okay, I'm going. <laughs> all right. So um, my daughter is – 14 and she went away with a family this week Mm. for a bit of a holiday and they very kindly took her with them and I'm sure she's having a fabulous time uh and well a few things I gave her some money to take away with her I gave her 150 dollars for the week um the purpose being to buy some food and stay alive um it is not what the money's been spent on (laughs) So um, she's sent me a few pictures. She's got a new Frank Green drink bottle. And if anybody... So tell us how you feel about the drink bottle, Mel. Yeah, look, not into (laughs) brands personally and spending that much money on a drink bottle. And we've got a cupboard full of drink bottles at home. So I would never have done that. I know. It is a sustainable drink bottle. Okay. An Australian brand. But yes, I understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Not doing it for me. Anyway, uh, it's an expensive (laughs) drinking vessel. Anyway, she's extremely happy and proud of it. So I, I said congratulations. Oh, oh, good on you. (laughs) And she also bought a really nice uh, jumper, which actually looks a bit fabulous. So all the essentials to stay alive is what's happening uh, for her at the moment. She just won't eat for the next week. Oh, she's eating very well (laughs) as well. She's she's living the high life. It's great. (laughs) And then it also got me to thinking because I was um, looking at my Instagram reels last night and there was a meme that popped up and... Oh my god, it triggered me because it was like what you how you treat your old your first child versus your youngest. Oh yes. So I she's the youngest and I've got another child who's 16 and I like don't know if I would have done the same for him. I think I would have made him work hard. There would have been lectures about what you can like the mm. rules are different. And I he would have I had to earn that money big time and then I just feel like I give it to her and there's and I'm like ha 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 like it's just yep. so easy. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, I was a bit yep. triggered by that with um y- yeah, no, definitely. I I think it brings up lots of things, doesn't it? It brings up like is it because you think you want to do it perfectly, what you perceive as perfectly for the first one and you learn a lot of stuff along the way and you know, you do it differently for your second. Is it personality driven? Is it gender driven? I know all of those questions. <laughs> I have no idea. Like, I wish I had the answer to it. But I'm like, mm-hmm. when I was on Instagram, I'm like, these people are inside of my brain. How do they know like that this is so relevant to me? <laughs> and then I've got my other child locked up at home, and he's not on a holiday. He's uh, no, he's, he's got to he's work got at home. Chores. <laughs> So I don't know the answer to that. All I'm saying, it's a bit of an awareness um, Mm. around those two things, how I treat my children differently, whether Mm. that's fair, um, Mm. and also how I feel about when I give them my money and what they spend it on. Yeah, I think there's so many things that come up from that because, you know, one is if we give, and this comes back to children and money, if we give our kids money, do we want to have control about how they spend it? and put our layers of values on it like or do we give that money i mean children you have to i mean you know if they're going on a holiday or you know you have to give them something that's right um yeah that as long as they're fed and watered and they learn so much like those things that she bought she goes they were on sale mum and i'm like 
she was like quoting me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's learning something. She yeah. knows how much a drink bottle costs. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Maybe not the earning potential. So I think, so for the learning yeah. for me, I think I just, and with what I want to do with that awareness is what I do with uh, both of my children mm. Mm. and how I treat them. Yeah. Maybe you loosen up on one and crack down on the other. Yeah, that's right. And um, let go a little bit on if you're going to give them money, it's their yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the mind, yeah, that's exactly right. And and just I think the mindfulness around it too, because just by having these thoughts around those things, you know, might change something that we do for good. So yeah, it's great. My truth this week um, is the old chestnut of the gym. Oh, so. <laughs> what's been happening at the gym? <laughs> Uh, so I, um, I, uh, prioritize, um, or try to prioritize health, um, and it doesn't always work, but, um, I've been going to, um, a community gym that I love and I love the ladies that go there and I've been connected to that for, I don't know, maybe eight years, a long time. So, um, I love it, but I'm finding recently I'm not getting there as much as I like. I love doing weights and I, I love the strength training and, uh, yeah, so I pay really good money, um, to go to the gym and, and have some personal training and, you know, those type of things. And, uh, you know, it comes a lot out of the budget and then I you're think, gonna, am I you going to put it? a number on it? Okay. I love putting numbers on it. I will things. put a number on it. I spend $300 a month, okay. um, yeah, uh, I'm doing it. But so, you're almost going to say the, a week there for a minute. No. So, and when you said a month, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, a month. Actually, they've just rejigged how they do it and, and they're offering. So um, it actually came down a little bit. It was closer to 350 So Okay. 300 So um, I feel f- to get value out of that, you know, how maybe we break things down or my logical brain breaks things down, that if I go twice a week, okay, you know, yeah. that's uh, – yeah, what is that? Yeah, it's about thirty something dollars. I have. <laughs> yeah, it's about thirty bucks a well, thirty for yeah a session, thirty five yeah. dollars a session, something like that. And you feel like that's so. worthwhile. That is good bang for buck, and it's good for you, good for your health. Exactly, good and I like it because I I've got it. I like that um, it's there, and I've got consistency. You know, when I go, um, and that because I feel if I gave it up. I don't want to lose that strength training, and I really like the gym and the, and the people that I go to it with. So, um, yeah, so yeah, just feeling a bit guilty about not utilising that from you know how much it's costing me, but I'm not getting you know I'm, you know I'm not looking after my health. More importantly, so so hang on, did you say you went to the gym this week? No, no. I haven't been this week. Okay. <laughs> That's the problem. Okay. And it's Thursday. Right. Um, but do you know what? We you... have a session tonight. Okay. At half past five, I think. So I'm committing right now. I'm going tonight. And then Friday and the weekend? Uh, are you only going to get the second session in or are you giving up this no, week? No, I think I'm just going to fit the one in. Okay. Um, yeah. Does that mean you do three next week? Well, no. this is this yeah. also happens. So then you feel like you need to make it up and then that just becomes too much really pressure. Well, you know, no, no. You've let, got it to go. let it go. Let it go. <laughs> so, yes. So next week, at least two sessions. But I'm going to go tonight. That yeah. One. Yeah. Very good. Okay. And have you ever let go of a gym membership? Like, is it for those reasons? I haven't. Till about eight years ago, I'd never, never been to a gym. So um, it really um, wasn't my, wasn't my bag. I always thought um, it wasn't. But I really love um, women in the community. There's a lot of like-minded people. So that's always kept me connected. And once um, I understand the benefit of strength training, that. Um, I feel like if it's I play tennis as well and I feel, I've always played tennis and I feel like if I ever let it go I would I would not struggle to get back, get to, back it. to it and then I wouldn't it's have anything true. to replace it with so yeah. um I I've stuck at it for that period of time and I plan to stick at it for life very good just when this happens well, then we just it's a bit the pick same. myself up a bit of accountability Move on. <laughs> yep let it go and yep you know but the very next thing I can do is go to the gym tonight yeah that's it stay committed <laughs> Yep, Love it is good money spent, right? You know, it really is. I, yeah, I think also sometimes we we feel that we don't. It's a bit like um, health and money. I feel are the two things that we feel like we should nail ourselves because we just know they have to be done, but and we we shouldn't spend money on them. But really, you. What better places to actually spend money, money. if you're looking after your your health and you've got your fundamentals of money right? I just it. 
yeah, it's logical, but I think yeah, naturally we we don't we We've think we to, shouldn't have to spend money on those things. things. But there's also no right or wrong. Like no. um, everybody, sh- you know, ideally it'd be good if everyone valued their health um, mm. and did things about it. But it doesn't mean everyone necessarily needs a uh, gym membership. Yeah, it's gym true. membership. It's like doing your own thing. Go for bushwalks. Do whatever exactly. you need to. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But spend the money on the things that you love that you know, put va- increase the value mm. of your life. Yeah. yeah. So, so true. Okay. Yeah. So today <laughs> our, our main topic um, that we want to talk about is the difference between um, the space that we work in, which um, people would traditionally call as money coaches um, and we like to refer to ourselves as financial well-being Great. coaches um, and we kind of feel like that sits in the middle of one end you've got financial planners um, and then on the other side you've got financial counsellors as well. So we've got all these people in this uh, financial money Mm. space who can help and support your life but we want to talk about the differences of each today. Yeah, that's Um, right and really unpack that because um, this middle space is really quite a new thing um, Mm -hmm. and um we we get asked all the time actually what it is and a lot of people think we might be financial planners or counselors so That's it really right. is a good chance to unpack it and help um help you understand the differences so mm. do we want to start off talking about financial planning yeah because i would say that that's the traditional space of money and like if mm. you were going to go and get some money advice then you would talk to a financial advisor or a planner yeah that's right or your family <laughs> yeah or your family and, and the thing is um financial planning has gone through a whole lot of regulatory change over recent years um and it's because of That accountability of if you go to a financial planner and they tell you to invest in something and that something doesn't work out, um, then they're on the line. Like So basically that accountability is shifted to a financial planner advising you the wrong thing. Um, Now... And also, like, there was a whole lot of, like, financial planners having um, fingers in the pie and selling you investments that... They were were getting extra benefit from. Yeah, they were getting extra benefit from. So it benefited them by selling particular um, investments, really. So they just made that space so regulated. Um, and the cost for mm. financial planners to operate in that space became really huge and the risks also increased. So we're talking, this has happened in the last five to 10 years, I would mm. say, probably 10 years um, mm. where financial planners have been much more regulated. It st- started coming in, mm. um, yeah, to this space. I probably remember about eight years ago. Yeah. And uh, and the requirements for financial planning also has increased as well as far as education. Mm. Um, so it's weeded out a lot of, a lot of financial planners have left the industry and the ones that have stayed, it's actually been harder for them to continue to operate. So they've actually, I would say that, um, financial planning space has shifted much more and is geared towards assisting people who are in the, um, close to retirement or in the retirement phase of their life where they're, they've got a build up pension already and they, uh, need that managed. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It has, you know, definitely moved because it's, um, for when you're doing middle life, um, the costs of financial planning are great. So they, by law, need to give you something called a statement of advice, um, to give you financial advice and then, you know, to prepare that and go through, there's a systematic way they need to go through that. Um, takes a lot of work and then obviously their insurances. So yeah, their, their fee up front and then their ongoing management is really expensive. Um, and so many, many it can be for middle Australia. It. So what we yeah. want to call expensive, you know, it can be out of reach for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so people stay away and mm. avoid it. Mm. Um, so I have actually been working with a financial planner mm. and the, um, I would say the benefit that I get is the tax and superannuation advice. Yeah. 
um, because my husband and I were both self-employed and um, so it didn't um, accumulate a lot of superannuation early in our lives. So how to maximize that. And my partner is also older than me as well, so closer to that retirement age. And there's so many things that I don't know about. Tax laws, superannuation mm. laws, I have no idea. It's not my forte. Mm. So the benefit that I have from having that relationship, I can see... Um, but I can also see why a lot of people don't engage with the service yeah. as well. Yeah, it it um, it definitely has its place, and it's it's um, you know can be really really helpful. The two of the key things that financial planners can do they can um, work with you and give you investment advice about where to put your money um, and. By law regulatory, they can talk about your superannuation and they also do like life and income insurances. So those are the areas that a financial planner will look after. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then on the other side, Mel, financial counselling. Financial counselling is more so for those who are in hardship. So um, usually it's triggered by more of a life event, uh, maybe a separation, divorce or a death potentially or something significant like a loss of a job or mm. something maybe where, you're nearly going to be homeless that's um, right you know so something's changed in your life and you're no longer able to meet your um, obligations and usually it's around debts and liabilities so you might have accumulated loans that you can no longer pay for or um, to maintain a, a lifestyle like or maintain mm. your house housing is one thing yeah or be on the very brink of that being imminent and not having a way forward or out of that so that's right yeah mm. and and uh, historically in australia uh, financial counseling is a not-for-profit mm-hmm. um are run by not-for-profit organizations so um that offer those um financial counseling and that services. might um, go into debt negotiations with uh, mm-hmm. banks or lenders with you and provide you with counseling service mm-hmm. as well um, for mm-hmm. your mental health and also provide other services around housing um, and things like that because they'll right. be real, um, associated with some charitable bodies and yeah. things like that exactly yeah and they might have funding from the government that help them support run those agencies. Yeah. And I know that we, like, I suppose that's the scary thing about money, that we're always, like, um, like at sliding doors moments. Like, mm. we could all end up in a situation like that, or m- mm-hmm. many of us anyway, um, mm. because so many things aren't within our control. But I suppose that's where we fit in to this middle space of how do you manage your everyday life? So with the mm. money stuff. Um, yeah, it's the to more prevent that current going definitely into preventative, hardship. and having those good, you know, money management financial um, skills and foundations to to prevent those situations occurring. Um, and also, it is a bit of planning ahead, though. So we talk about the one to five year period. So it's what you're doing now, and really getting you know in place with setting goals and what you want and achieving hopefully achieving some of those goals within the next one to five. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you? So let's dig into that a little bit then. So we're now talking about that middle space, which isn't going to see a financial counsellor. You don't really need to see a financial planner yet for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um, But hey, everyday life is feeling like it could be better. I would say that people who need a money coach um, uh, is somebody who would need support around them. And I think that 90% or 99% of All the population of us, <laughs> probably need support and accountability around yeah. us to set up systems um, and to become empowered to know how the system works around us and how our own money works. Yeah, definitely. Well, Mel, because Mel and I um, are mortgage brokers by trade and, and I was a, and we've been bankers um, for a long period of time, so we've worked in this space. But what you find is when we work with people um, through mortgage broking, those conversations come up a lot about what am I doing with my everyday money and I feel like I'm not doing enough. Um, or something's changed and I feel like, you know, my savings are going down, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, you know, I don't, yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm not in charge of, of, of my money. Yeah, I think too it's like those, I think the people who reach out to us, there's those two different defined groups of people. So there's those ones who are like, hey, if I don't make some changes, some bad stuff mm, could I'm happen. I'm going backwards. Yeah, like yeah. hang on a minute. <laughs> 
ah, uh, this is not sustainable and we just need one small thing to change. Um, or I can see that I am not probably going to re- meet my retirement goals and I'm going to have to work forever. What am I doing? You know, while I'm still working, how can I maximize and make the most of this or make sure the worst doesn't mm. happen? Cause mm-hmm. I need to make some changes, some substantial changes. And I need somebody to yeah. tell us what to do. Definitely. So our word last year <laughs> was, uh, courage because we realized that we needed to step into that space to help and support people to tell people hard truths because it really is what they were coming to us to hear, weren't they? Yeah. And for us to be brave and not just go there, there. Yeah. And like call people That's out right. and say, if this continues and show people, you know, well, hey, your money's going to run out at this point or. That's right. Or you can't achieve those goals and just not realistic. You're going to have to either scrap them or readjust them or. Yeah. And I think people innately know these things because that's why they're coming. That that group of people are coming because they know if they continue, it ain't, it's not working. It's not going great. (laughs) So, and yeah, so Mm. that's where those hard truths do Mm. come out. Mm. No, it's, it's really important. And I agree. I think some people know, but they want like, um, you know, that money coach, um, around them that can actually say those things and then yeah because I, I think too like in a friendship situation right then your friends are going to go it's yeah. all right darling don't worry mm. or we don't want to invest too much into you anyway because that's a bit scary and I don't, I'm not really qualified <laughs> I don't want to upset you <laughs> and I think that's we were a bit square, scared about even saying that we're qualified to help people oh, so there gosh, was work yes. that we had to do go hang on a minute and then just that practicing of saying well hang on this is where you're going to end up this is what's happening but it's mm-hmm. always on to that person to make the change. Always. So we're not here to say do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll be perfect. It's, well, hang on, no, mm. this is the information. Mm. This mm-hmm. is where it's leading you. Exactly. And some people will continue, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's hard because changing behaviors is difficult. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So I, maybe if we come back to like a definition of financial well-being and what it's made up of. So financial well-being is how we feel about our money. Mm-hmm. Um, and then financial um, well-being, if you want to uplift your financial well-being, it's made up of two key components. And one is financial capability. And that's about understanding how money works in your household, where it goes, um, and uh you know, um, you know, knowing your number, we talk about knowing your number, you know, what, how much is left over after all your expenses and um, all your spending, all your spending. Exactly. Um, and then it's also about capability though, is also about understanding the financial system in which we work in, um, and what products are available, how they work, how interest gets charged. If you use, you know, if you borrow money, um, you know, how to repay, how to optimize those, how to, you know, reduce the amount of interest you, you might be charged, mm-hmm. um, and really understanding the system that we work in. So, um, financial wellbeing really for us is empowering and about financial education. So, so people can make their own decisions and, you know, you know, work out what's best for them. We all really know. We just want information um, so we can make those best decisions. Um, so that's capability. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is uh, financial resilience. So financial resilience is about what happens if I have a big event that happens that impacts my money. Um, what do I do in the case of? So that, my backup plans. Yeah. <laughs> and I, when we realized that this was a thing, right? So mm. was it 12 or 18 months ago we realized oh, that maybe reckon, 12 months ago? Oh, I reckon longer. Okay. Yeah. And then because um, the research was saying, so, so we've found this out that these are the two components of financial well-being, right? So when we realized that resilience was in there, and you went away with Angela, mm. who's on our team, and wrote this long list of resilience questions about. Oh yeah. Um, so all the things. What would you do if? What would you do if? Do you remember some yeah. of the things on that list? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the triggers are, you know, for example, if you, um, um, you know, economic events like you know the, the one right now is really relevant. We've had twelve interest rate rises. Has anyone ever planned for that? Um, and what would you do if? if? Rates you know, went up really high. High. But um, some of the ones on the list, um, you know, are things like, what if I lost my job? 
what if I got sick and couldn't work, you know, for a year? Yeah. What would you do? You know? uh, and meeting retirement plans and goals yeah. and things like that. It was things that I didn't really want to think about. So mm. when I – and, like, it's really hard work looking at some of those resi- – doing that mm. resilience work. Mm. And I think if there's anyone else out there that's like me, mm. we put it aside and we think, uh, oh, no, because I'm a bit of a Susie Sunshine mm. when mm. <laughs> it comes to mm. – um, planning for the future I, mm-hmm. I just think i'm heading for the best i'm you know i'm okay if it's um probably even keel i'm shooting for higher but if i end up like this i'm okay but i don't like thinking about those worst case scenarios mm. mm-hmm. i am um yeah it's hard i don't know there's a word that just says um. that i am i don't know just just think everything's going to be okay all the oh, time. Oh, yes. Uh, positive, optimistic. Positive, optimistic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I definitely yeah. am all of those things. But just yeah. take for granted, actually. That's ah. what it is. I take for granted that everything's going to be okay. And my partner says that to me all the time as well. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you take me for granted. You take this, in, you know, my yeah. job for granted. Like, it could just... And he, I think he's got that spin what if that stops? is... What if it's not? What if it doesn't? Yeah. And he has that fear simmering underway. And I think I push yep. that away because I don't want yep. to live my life like that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, it's interesting because um, there is... The studies show that there's a clear linkage between having better financial well-being if you're optimistic. So... It's yes. not necessarily a bad thing. But I still have to be optimistic. realistic too. And I suppose <laughs> it was harder for me to come to the work because it wasn't natural, right? Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think some people are a little bit better at disaster planning than what I am. Mm. So for mm. me to even look at that list and go, right, mm. well, I've got to do a bit of that planning. And I think we mm. bring that into our business better now. Like now mm-hmm. that we understand yeah. it, we go, well, let's have a resilience conversation. Yeah. What if this happens? What if this yeah. doesn't what happen? Are we what do? if we don't pull this off? Yeah. And- yeah. And it is. <laughs> Worst scenario planning is really helpful. It takes away fear. And look, it might only be it a does. 1% chance, hopefully, that that ever happens. So I just want to talk about that taking away fear piece mm. for a minute because I was fearful to do it, right? Mm. So you have the first initial, mm. I'm scared to do the work, but then once you do it, it takes away the fear. So it's scary to do it and you have to get comfortable in the space. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, that Definitely. was true for me. Yeah. I think I think it is uh, for everyone. It's so easy not to look at something, you know, uh, when... Uh, we are worried about that and if it happens what will happen to us but if you actually work through it um many of the time you know most of the time you will work out what the solution is and even if you don't have the solution right away you know the position yeah. and once you know the facts you can then put That's your head right. to the next bit so i did this um worst case scenario and i so i thought well what happens if his income does stop Mm. something happens to him and he's not working Mm. um and then i did a whole stop take of our position right Mm. like the assets that we owned if we sold because his uh, owns a truck and some machines and things so if we sold that and we sold our house and then how much money we had left over and then that was still enough to buy in my situation another house which would be much more modest but I actually looked at that and I looked at realestate.com and I thought if that happened I'm actually okay with that like that is the reality of my situation and then that was what took the fear away it's like if that happened I'm cool with that yeah but some people right aren't in that situation so and everybody has a different fear level when it it comes to these backup plans and some people have got their back up against the wall already yeah definitely um, like particularly like in a marriage breakup or it's a really big one where they can't maintain or the house has to be sold and mm. they don't have mm. the means or mode mm. to buy something else. Mm, exactly. I actually think, and actually talking about a block, um, we're doing financial resilience planning. I think in, um, and I might be controversial here, in a couple relationship, it's actually really healthy to do individual scenario planning because if something happens and that relationship breaks up what would either of you do and have you worked those scenarios out and i think yes, people are way one. too scared to go there because they're saying you know are we thinking that we're going to break up it should be actually when things are really good because then it takes that fear away and i think 
here is my philosophy that it'll, it'll probably strengthen the relationship and unlikely ever to happen. But people are too scared to do that work. That is together. To- I can relate to that too. Like mm. that's what those conversations have brought out in us too. Mm. And we compare ourselves to the, um, and that's I suppose why financial independence within my relationships been important mm. to me as well. I think it's really important for every person in every situation. Mm. You know, predominantly, and I'm going to come back to gender, women predominantly stay out of the workforce, raise their children. They might not keep their skills up, their work skills up. Um, And then if anything happens, they're not in a position, if they don't have enough money, once the money is divided up to buy another home, then because they don't have job skills or enough to be able to borrow enough, then that, that... is a real issue um, for those people because where am I going to live? And that is why financial well-being is the lowest, which we've talked about in a previous podcast around women women and gender and, um, yeah, why women in particular have poorer outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then that also brings me to um, that imbalance in relationships as well Mm -hmm. around earning. So, Mm -hmm. and being able to, so... And it's not always a gender thing. I've spoken to several men this week who are earning less than their female partners. Um, but so, so it doesn't even matter what the genders are or what type of relationship mm. you know you're in. Mm. If you've got an, it's very unusual to have a very an ex- exact balance in earning in a relationship. It's almost I've never come across it. Somebody's earning more money than the other one, and yep, somebody definitely. may be earning no money, and that causes psychological imbalance within definitely particular well for the person who's earning less money not having the right to or thinking it usually is a self thing that they Mm. don't have the right to have an equal say of where the money is being spent Mm -hmm. and what the choices are being made for the future of the family unit yep and that is uh Mm -hmm. perpetuates those feelings of inadequacy and yeah um so the best relationships that I see are the ones where the people are earning less, but they may be the money manager. Like I love that combination yeah. where they're like yep. managing the accounts, um, making the decisions. Yep, definitely an equal seat at the table. Um, you know, all conversations, decisions around money, understanding, and and their partner knows exactly because I think sometimes you might be the money earner, and then the other partner takes on the responsibility of the bookkeeping, but. That doesn't mean that that's being passed on. And what I see in those relationships is the money owner still wants to make the decisions and they see the actual bookkeeping of it as a lesser thing, like a task that has to be done. Um, so, and, and that still doesn't, that's not equal. Equal means that both people know exactly where the money goes, how it gets distributed, and decisions are together around what we do with our money yeah so if we do that regardless of whether you've decided to stay home and raise children or not work as much Mm. is so important to do sorry to be equal you know so yeah it's irrelevant what you choose to do right because there's no judgment here it's a job role to your kids Uh, yeah that's huge yeah (laughs) but step up and push forward raise yourself up to and that is hard and it takes time mm. or you just need to, you know, put yourself out there and you need to listen to us an awful lot, right? Yeah, that's right. Get yeah, us on you your know, side. First of all, know, you know, know, know your money, build your financial capability and, you know, challenge and look at your financial resilience. Yeah. You know, that's financial well-being. Yeah. Funny yeah. where this conversation has taken us. Yeah. Because we were um, talking a little bit about this yesterday too. So like um, if you were to um like increase those skills for yourself with a partner like come back and say hey i know my number Mm. that can be we don't do that sometimes because we worry about how they're going to take and receive that (laughs) and that's a fear yep so this is that fear that we're talking about too so our money comes with so many fears it does but it's a bit like the old saying if we don't do something differently you know nothing is ever going to change you've got to do something differently if you want you know somebody else to respond to you differently so yeah i definitely yeah get into it um and it does that's what will uplift your financial well-being and that remember that's how you feel about it so it's not so scary and you know you're not worried about what might happen because you actually know the facts and then off the back of that you'll make 
decisions or what if decisions yeah Yeah. so let's just bring the conversation back a little Mm. bit like so to we're talking about this middle space of what money coaching is so there's other money coaches out there we refer to ourselves as financial well-being coaches yeah and um just on that though financial well-being i is different to just a money coach so when we think of a money coach we might think of budgeting Uh, it's not just budgeting it's a very financial well-being coaching is a very holistic um Uh, type of coaching it addresses both your behaviors with money uh, understanding like that budgeting component but then also goal setting um and um you know and align to your values and where you actually want it's very holistic life um life money coaching maybe yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> life money coaching with practical steps on how the system works as well and setting up a system that works for you. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. All right. Was well, there anything else that you want to mention in there? No, I think, uh, yeah, that uh, I hope you've got something out of that. And we'll cover off in future about the actual steps that we take as well in uh, – financial our financial well-being programs as well yeah definitely because it could be something that you could you know tap in listen to us and start playing along with at home and doing you know taking on some of those exact strategies yeah definitely we'll take you through our eight-step plan through the podcasts yeah all righty so question of the week question of the week is (laughs) uh it's come in and the question is Darlene, what is the fixed rate mortgage cliff? What is oh, that and what are people talking about? And all this bank jargon and terminology. So again, you know, linking back to what I was just saying, this is key and how it links is because this is about financial capability. This is understanding all the words that you're probably hearing on the TV and in the media and have no clue of what they're talking about. So mortgage cliff and, means, huh? Well, you might know what it means if you're one of the people who are in on it. the cliff. <laughs> And you've already True. fallen off. Yeah. And that is so many Australians. So don't, if you are in this position, um, it, 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 you're not alone. It, it's it's just how it is right now. Yes. So The stats are massive, like they're billions of dollars. So what the mortgage but, cliff is, is all the fixed rates. So people who took out a really low fixed rate um, in 2020, usually, uh, or 2021 when the rates were got down to as low as 2% or even lower. Yeah, I've, I think the best that you know that we have uh people on was about 1.89 yep Mm. so having a 1.89 interest rate Mm -hmm. and that expires so people were taking out two and three year fixed rates which are now expiring now Mm in 2023 um, and lots of them for the second half of 2023 Mm -hmm. uh and then what happens at the end of a fixed rate is you revert to the current variable rate which is now around 6%. Mm, So you're paying interest, you're paying a repayment and a calculation at 1.89 and then all of a sudden that's going to expire one month and then the next month your repayment is going to be at a a 6% interest rate. And so we're seeing so many repayments have gone up by $1,000 a month. Oh, easy. So on Mm -hmm. an average mortgage, where does that Mm -hmm. extra $1,000 come from? Because Mm -hmm. And the problem here is that um, people can't when they took out the loan if they can't reafford that loan again right now so if we were to reassess your ability to mm. afford that loan the bank would not give you that money today if you went back and said can I have that same amount of money so all those people are pretty much stuck in loans mm. Um, mm. yeah that's that right they can't necessarily afford it particularly with the cost of living as yeah, well yeah exactly um, yeah so the thing is, I would how it's portrayed in the media is really scary, and I think that puts the fear yeah. into everybody. And I would encourage everybody that if you're in this situation to step back because it comes back to financial well-being coaching and financial capability, mm-hmm. and it's about understanding your numbers. And once it's your own lane, like whatever your situation is in your number, your income minus your expenses with your new mortgage repayment in that, what does that mean? What's left over or not? And what adjustments do we need to make? Um, If you plan for that, even ahead, if it's, you know, you've still got some months out, you know, you, you need to, you need to start there. You need to work out what your new repayment's going to be and slot that into what your numbers are for your life to see what difference that's going to make and where is that going to come from and what changes do you need to make to make that work Mm. 
yeah, what changes do you need? And those changes could be, okay, well, we have to reduce our discretionary spending. It could go to, gee, I need to earn more money. Or maybe I need to sell something. Maybe I need to restructure, you know, some of my loans to give me some more cash flow for a period of time. There's all looking at all your situation holistically, you know, with with what are the best options for me to do to get yeah. through this. And, you know, coming through to interest rates, um, economically, um, there is projection that we're going to stay in these interest rates probably for a couple of years. At the moment, that's the forecast. So we can't have wishful thinking and think it's going to go back to two or three percent in six or 12 months that's not not going to happen so we need to plan and really start working through what that situation looks like for us yeah that's right Mm. um so knowing your numbers just put a number on it work it out um and if you know somebody else who mentions this to you you can give them some great advice and if we're ever in this environment ever again um where and particularly if you ever take out a fixed rate is having some always being having that foresight on what is happening when that fixed rate comes Mm, off um Mm. because i remember Mm -hmm. you always gave good advice which is a bit hard now in retrospect but you were Mm. saying rates are going to get to six percent and the whole team you've made us all Mm. start making our repayments at six percent that's right and the thing is people think um if i can just finish off people when you hear about this mortgage cliff it's bad 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 it's actually not people if if you've locked in for a period of time and yes. had the advantage of a low interest rate of 1.89 or 1.99 for two or three years laughing happy days Amazing. um you've had that advantage now and that is really about our money and our goals and managing our money because we need to manage and not always think that it's going to be 1.89 or yeah. 6%. We need to manage so we get consistency and that we can ride through these waves and we don't have to make those big adjustments. If we actually do more financial well-being planning, then we're in a position where we can, you know, they'll, they'll feel like a blip. It won't feel so huge when you get those those rate changes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Mm. Cool. Well, the last thing we want to uh, leave mm. you with is a question heading into the next episode. Uh huh. And what's that question, Mel? Uh, what is your money personality? Oh, we can talk <laughs> money personalities next time. We are going to break <laughs> that down. And if you look in the show notes, we'll have a link to our money personality quiz. So take the quiz um, and even have a chat to your partner about it. It'll hopefully be very enlightening. Yeah. Well, see you next time. Till then. See you later. <laughs> okay. At The Money Collective, we provide financial wellbeing premium coaching, mortgage broking and workplace financial wellbeing programs, which we couldn't do without the seamless support of our fabulous team. If you'd like to find out more, head to themoneycollective.com.au or our socials to take action and engage our services. In our Facebook group, join the conversation and help us break down the taboo around money. All content in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is generally nature. For tailored personal advice, please seek out a professional.